Good morning. The reading this morning is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, beginning at verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. What I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Those who were my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit. They threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head and I thought I was about to perish. I called on the name Lord from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. You Lord took up my case. You redeemed my life. Lord, you have seen the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. Lord, you have heard their insults, all their plots against me, what my enemies whisper and mutter against me all day long. Look at them, sitting or standing, they mock me in their songs. Pay them back what they deserve, Lord, for what their hands have done, Put a veil over their hearts and may your curse be on them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. I'm just going to return Judith's Bible to him. (laughs) Now, um, I have to say, I've got, a, um, I've got a reasonable head for heights, which is just as well, but given my love for mountains, a reasonable head for heights. But I have to say, I really do not like cliffs. And um, when, I just don't understand. Why do people have to sit on the edge of a cliff with their feet dangling over? Why is it that people have to just get up right to the edge of the cliff and then just look over and see how steep it is and how far down it is don't they realize that you can slip on a cliff don't they realize that cliffs from time to time just crumble and they they fall down so not only do I not like being at the top of a cliff I actually don't like being at the bottom of a cliff either and of course there was a I guess quite well-known tragedy of of a girl uh, I think it was on Beachy Head or near there who took uh, had a photograph of herself taken doing a star jump on the edge of the cliff but tragically she misjudged it and jumped backwards and it was the last thing that she did that's just awful but then if you ask people to move away from the edge they're they're just as likely to say look don't worry it's okay Uh, we're fine there's nothing to fear here we're completely safe do not fear we're okay and I'm my my stomach just churns when I see pictures of them where when I actually see them there and I would say there's plenty to fear cliffs are by definition dangerous please don't tell me there is nothing to fear on the top of a cliff now Let's change the scene. Not a cliff top, but actually Jerusalem, uh, nearly uh, it's about 2,600 years ago. And just at the beginning of our reading, as Lamentations chapter 3 and at verse 46 there, all our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We've suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. Or more literally, just the end there, that word destroyed is more literally shattered, wrecked. And it's a desperate situation for them. And uh, in this, uh, our final passage in our series on mental health awareness and Lamentations chapter 3 this morning, um, we see actually the only word spoken by God in the whole of the book of Lamentations. And it's there in verse 57. Verse 57, and he says, Do not fear. And in the circumstances, that just seems an utterly ridiculous thing to say, doesn't it? Do not fear. Look at verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. 
And uh, that's what hippos do when they're trying to dominate one another, isn't it? Um, uh, do not fear. Do not fear. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Do not fear. Really? You must be joking. Absolutely. Now, our situation is different, of course. We're not standing on the edge of a cliff, nor are we sitting in the ruins of our country, our city, our faith. No, our situation is different. But you could well be thinking, as I look to the future, and you could be thinking as I look back to, the, say, the last year or so and see the changes and see the way that COVID has, maybe you're thinking it's destroyed my education, it's destroyed my first year and a half, possibly two years at uni. Maybe you're thinking as I look to the future, well, what about my family life? When are we ever going to see the children, the grandchildren or whatever? Maybe you're thinking it's pros- it's, uh, COVID has, has just wrecked the prospects of a, of a decent career. And maybe you're suffering from a long COVID and you're thinking, am I actually ever going to get through this and you're, and you're saying do not fear really there's plenty to fear about there's plenty to fear about as we look to the future and and Jeremiah here he's a mentally and physically strong guy as far as we can see and yet verse 48 streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed my eyes will flow unceasingly without relief Maybe over this past year you've cried more than you would normally would. I have. <clears throat> but how can we possibly say, do not fear? How can God possibly say, do not fear? Well, let me give you three reasons why God can say to us, do not fear. I want to give you three reasons why not fearing, not fearing, is actually the best way forward in the midst of a global pandemic. Why not fearing is utterly reasonable. Why not fearing is a good thing to do. And why not fearing is therefore the best way forward. It may be difficult. I'm not um, underestimating that. It may be difficult. We may have to learn not to fear. We may have to make gentle progress towards that position of not fearing. We may have to ask the Lord Jesus to help us not to fear. I guess that's quite a likely one, isn't it? But the command of God is for Jeremiah then and for us now as well. Do not fear. Do not fear. How come? How come he can say that? Well, the first thing is this. Uh, Do not fear, because the Lord Jesus is, first of all, our only hope. Our only hope. And now, looking back those 2,600 years or so, you look back to Jerusalem, it was in a desperate situation. For instance, just take verse 51 there. What, what I see brings grief to my soul because, all the, because of all the women of my city. And it's quite likely that the women of the city were all the other little towns and little villages and so on around uh, Jerusalem, which had been taken, destroyed, razed to the ground by the Babylonians. So in our situation, in our situation, um, we would be thinking, for instance, of uh, Poynings or Fulking or Ed Burton. And I were just, uh, we walked up to the top of the Downs yesterday, just on the edge of the Downs, looking down from near Devil's Dyke. And so, so is that Fulking or Poynings? Which, uh, which way round is it? And we tried to work it out, didn't have a map with us. And, uh, uh, and I think we got it right. But, uh, but it's just talking about, they're, they're gone. Just they're not there anymore. Or you're thinking of Hurst Pierpoint, or Street, or Westmeston, gone, raised to the ground. Or you're thinking of Hassocks, or Kima, uh, or you're thinking just a little way, you know, to, maybe to Ditchling. And they've disappeared as well. They're just rubble on the ground there as you're standing up at Devil's Dyke and you're looking across the wheel there, gone. And Jeremiah is in deep and profound grief because of what he sees here. Verse 51, what I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Do you get the same when you see the stats on the television each night? I mean, it's improving a lot, isn't it? But 116,908 people have died uh, with COVID. 28 days and all that we know but 116,908 621 deaths were reported just yesterday 
it's getting better but actually we're still in a really difficult situation and uh, uh, do you get the same perhaps when you pick up a photo of the grandchildren and you think well am I any chance I'm going to see them anytime soon and we're tempted to put our trust aren't we in things like you know Matt Hancock or the NHS or JVT Jonathan Van Tam or uh, the vaccine or uh, our counsellor or whatever it is but in the end there is only one hope and his name is Jesus Christ there is only one hope um, as someone has written you can vent your anger and grief at him but in the end you have to trust him there is no other Jesus Christ, our only hope. So verse 50, until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. And there is an implied assumption there in verse 50, isn't there? That in the end, that God will see. And in the end, God will act for good for his people. And it's the same idea uh, over in verse uh, 55 here. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. We'll return to that in a moment. But it's talking, but it's the same idea. Actually, you're calling to God because he is our only hope. Jesus, our only hope. As uh, one guy wrote about this, our hope lies not in the man we put on the moon, but in the man we put on the cross. Jesus, our only hope. Someone else. Other men see only a hopeless end, but the Christian rejoices in an endless hope. And Jesus is genuinely our only hope, our only place to look. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, reigning, returning. The Lord Jesus our only hope and it's him who we need to look to when we're struggling when there's difficulty when there's a global pandemic we look to Jesus so for instance for every glance at the infection rates and a number of vaccinations uh, for every time you check your phone to see if uh, you've been called to, uh, to have your vaccination for instance take 10 looks at Jesus for every minute spent wondering about the new variants, spend 10 minutes with Jesus, talking to him about it. He is our only hope, the Lord Jesus. And in verse 52 to 57 here, Jeremiah tells his own story, his, his own testimony. And big thanks again to Alex for sharing something of, of his own walk through these uh, times of mental of mental health and, uh, uh, and and for Jeremiah here as you look at verses 52 to 57 he's almost certainly referring back to his own the book that's named after him Jeremiah chapter 38 and if you look at verse 53 here in verse 53 he says um, they tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me likely when he was down the well and the bottom of the well was really muddy and he was just sinking into the mire at the bottom of the well the word uh, pit could be a metaphor for a grave but it looks to me like it's Jeremiah's own experience they were expecting to stone him to death in the mud at the bottom of the well, a cistern there. And Jeremiah is, is, is desperate. And in his desperation, God speaks to him. And God says to him, Jeremiah, do not fear. Don't fear. Our only hope, our only reliable and true hope. And so we turn to him. And we turn away from other hopes. So... I mean, maybe our hope is in the vaccine. It's okay to have our, our hope in the vaccine, but what we also need to do is look above and beyond and behind the vaccine. And as we do that, then we can thank the Lord Jesus for their extraordinary development, for the way that they're getting out around the country. Um, uh, and we can thank him that in the UK it's going well, isn't it? And we can pray most certainly for other countries where it's going less well. But you see the big picture. It's a vaccine, but I hope actually is in the Lord Jesus above, beyond, and behind the vaccine program. That's what we have to do. He rules this pandemic. 
He allows this pandemic. He is answering the prayers of his people during this pandemic. And he will control this pandemic in his time. We put our trust in him. He is our only hope. And so in our loss and in our tears and in our numbness and in our desperation and in our, in our winter blues, let us consciously turn to him, the Lord Jesus, our only hope, who says to us, do not fear, but put your hand in mine and come to me and trust in me because I am your Lord and your Saviour. And as his people, we will put our trust in him. Do not fear the Lord Jesus, our only hope. But more than that, not just our only hope, he's also on our side. He's on our side. You look at verses 55 to 58 especially, but going on to verses 59 to 60. I called on your name, verse 55, Lord, from the depth of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief, and so on. Um, I, I played a bit of hockey over, over the years um, at college when I was a teacher and so on, theological college. Theological college, we had a team that was a real mixture. So we had some guys who played a bit of hockey before. We had some guys who were sporty, they could run, and they had an eye for a ball and so on. And, uh, uh, and we had one guy who was really, really good, called Paul. And he was really, really good. He was a defender. It meant that actually for our team, we might not score many goals, but it's extremely difficult to score against us when I was at Theological College, especially when Paul was in the team. Well, actually, only when Paul was in the team. Uh, we had a great defense just because he was almost impassable. Now, Paul says... Uh, uh, our, our, our guy Paul in our team was a great defender and we could trust that actually we'd do fine with him in our team now look verse 56 here you heard my plea do not close your ears to my cry for relief and uh, you can just see that Jeremiah down in a pit a well a cistern it's dried out uh, there he's clinging to God uh, and uh, who's not only his only hope but is on his sides who's playing for him and verse 58 is glorious you Lord took up my case it's like a it's it's a legal kind of idea it's like a court isn't it you redeemed my life and we can today say, we can say that of Jesus, can't we? Uh, or all the verbs that Jeremiah uses of God here, you can say them of Jesus now. So look at verse 56 and 57 and 58 and so on. And um, you heard, you came near, um, you said, you took up my case, you redeemed my life, you have seen. That's, those words are spoken of someone who's on our side and the Lord Jesus is on our side. That's why we do not fear. Not only is, our only, is he our only hope, but he's also on our side. It's tremendous, isn't it? In our own pit of, of despair and darkness and doubt and disturbance, um, just doing just that. The Lord Jesus speaks and he takes up our case and he protects our life. And maybe for you, maybe for you there's ongoing uh, medical worries or the pain they don't seem to be able to get on top of or anxiety for the future or worries for the children and, and so on. And uh, the truth that we see here pointed to as a clear fact that Jesus is our only hope. And that he's then not only our only hope, is on our sides. And it says here, He's redeemed our life as he died for us. And when the devil lies to us, perhaps in the middle of the night, you know, you know what you're like, you're entirely unlovely, unlovable, who could possibly forgive you for what you've done? Or he lies to you and he says, you're useless, you've got nothing to offer anyone, you are without value. Well, that can't be true. That cannot be true because Jesus, the Lord Jesus, who is Lord over the devil, 
is on your side. You, Lord, verse 58, took up my case. You redeemed my life. That is a great verse and worth remembering. And I love this idea of redeemed. Um, many years ago, uh, I worked with a guy called George Lehu when I was doing youth work, and uh, George was doing children's work. And uh, uh, his father-in-law and mother-in-law lived in Reading. And one day, George and his wife, Jill, were visiting, and uh, they, they'd changed the streets in Reading. And George and Jill drove down a one-way street the wrong way, and they were caught. And, uh, uh, and the case actually went to a magistrate's court. They didn't have to appear in person, but it went to a magistrate's court. Um, and, uh, and it just happened that Jill's dad, who was a magistrate, was the one who had to deal with the case. And in the morning after the case of George and Jill driving down the one-way street the wrong way, they had a letter from the magistrate, Jill's dad. And uh, to paraphrase it, it basically said, uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, I have to impose the law of the land. You are guilty of driving down a one-way street. And uh, we have to impose the appropriate fine. But I have great pleasure in enclosing a check made payable to you for the uh, total amount of the fine. Love, Dad. Or words to that effect. And, uh, but that's, uh, that's a lovely picture, isn't it? It's a lovely picture of what Jesus did for us. The price he paid for our wrongdoing. He redeemed us. He bought us back. He paid the price. He's on our side. So we come to him today afresh. And we can thank him that not only is, our, is he our only hope, but he's on our side. He's with us. He's with us in this. Lord Jesus, our only hope, who's on our side. And then the third reason why we should not fear is because he is a God of justice. Now, look at verse 61 to 66. And here, it looks a bit ugly, doesn't it? You read that and you think, well, you know, pay them back what they deserve, Lord, verse 64. But in Jeremiah's time, that was entirely normal in times of war. But we recoil from that. You know, we think, where's the forgiveness? Where's their being nice to people? Where's the uh, reasonableness about this and so on? Um, but God is a God of justice. I loved uh, this little account. That a U.S. Supreme Court Justice Horace Gray once informed a man who had appeared before him in a lower court and was now appearing before him in the Supreme Court. And uh, he'd escaped the previous conviction on a technicality. And Horace Gray said to him, I know that you are guilty and you know it. And I wish you to remember that one day you will stand before a better and wiser judge and there you will be dealt with according to justice and not according to law. And our God, our God is a God of justice. We know we, God can't ignore injustice. God takes the longer view, and so should we. And we see that God has heard this prayer of Jeremiah. You read verses 60, 61 to 66 here, and God has heard that prayer, and God has answered that prayer, and every prayer like it. And that seems an outrageous thing to say, doesn't it? Until you realize that actually he's heard that prayer, and he's answered that prayer on the cross and then again when Jesus will return as Lord and judge of all he's heard this prayer he answered this prayer when Jesus died on the cross those prayers for judgment were answered at the cross of Christ because Jesus was judged for your sin and for mine and for the sins of the Babylonians. He paid the penalty for wrongdoing. And in verse 65, put a veil over their hearts, the Babylonian hearts, and may your curse be on them. It was. As Jesus took their sins and was cursed himself on the cross in his own body. Today we thank the Lord Jesus the one who is the God of justice, that he died the ultimately just death on the cross for us as he voluntarily took human sin and rebellion on, his, on himself, in his own body, and was cursed for us. 
but we'll also see it at the return of Jesus, at the second coming. Because if people don't accept uh, uh, d- the offer of forgiveness that comes from Jesus after he's died for them, if they won't accept that that's bought by Jesus, then unless they turn to God and accept that offer of forgiveness, then on judgment day they will be judged for their evil. The Babylonians will be judged for their evil on judgment day. Jesus is the God of justice. And in Jesus, our Lord, our God of justice, we know that wrongs, terrible wrongs, done by us, done by other people to us, have been paid at the cross. And either his forgiveness is accepted or it will be paid for at the second coming with eternal condemnation. There is judgment day. And that is a wonderfully good day. After all, what kind of world would we be living in if there were no judgment and no hope? No hope at all. Do not fear. Do not fear, because the Lord Jesus is uh, our only hope. He's on our side, and he is a God of justice. I'm going to finish, um, because Eloise Hearn has written a number of poems, which I think people have found helpful. Um, And I want to finish by reading uh, another poem from Eloise which is on this theme, do not fear. Hard times seem unending, relentless trouble, punishment, a lesson of some kind, and maybe at last I am learning. Perhaps you are near. Perhaps I can hear your voice saying, Daughter, do not fear. Good times. Hard times are good times. I called you, O Lord, and you took up my case. Same circumstances, but you are redeeming them for me all along you were near but now I think I can hear your voice saying daughter do not fear